Thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. Um, first of all, how are the levels? Good? OK, excellent. Um, yeah, so my pleasure to be here in Australia for the second time. I, I went to Perth last year as part of this conference, and um, I guess people liked what I had to say, so they brought me back for the three other cities. It was just a little test. Like, is he going to upset too many people? Ah, OK, we can handle it. Um, so just a dis disclaimer here, things that you're going to hear are not what you're going to find uh, in any recommended tutorials of what to do. In fact, a lot of the things I'm going to talk about is uh, things that a lot of people in the industry and industry experts will tell you not to do. So um, foreshadowing a little bit. <laughs> um, I've uh, been a geek my whole life. I've uh, fell in love with computers back when I was a kid. Um, I started consulting quite early in uh, my last year of uh, high school and uh, continued to uh, fuel my passion with, uh, with technology uh, through all of the cool computers from 8-bit to 16-bit, etc. I was a huge fan of uh, uh, the Amiga series, which had amazing preemptive multitasking and uh, a lot of awesome music stuff. So if you're into the music scene at all, in the early 90s, you definitely came across one of these ma machines and Ataris, uh, STs, etc. So I come from that era. Um, I finally saw that I could actually do more than just consult on my own. I could consult and contract in large enterprises. And what, what did I walk into? Whoa. <laughs> All the stuff that I was doing was much harder um, at home than people dragging and dropping VB6 buttons onto forms and getting paid 10 times as much as me. So I said, whoa, wait a second. Something's wrong here. i got to fix my career. So in 2000, I embraced everything enterprise architecture and said, what, what's the difference here technology-wise? Why is this so, such a different attitude to hacking on stuff at home? Um, and uh, discovered through that um, Agile, UML, et cetera. In fact, uh, um, had the pleasure of meeting Greedy Booch himself on the way here, which was really awesome uh, for the first time to meet someone like that. Uh, so that was pretty neat. Got to catch up on some things. And, but in 2008, my life significantly changed as I finally saw that information systems are really same things over and over again. I mean, how many times are you going to do another insurance application? How many times over and over are you going to do the same point of sale system? Why is it always such a weird snowflake? Why can't we reuse a lot of the components? Um, so the answer was easy. It's like we invent new tools and new frameworks all the time. So then we have to redo the same thing and different things all the time. It's like a make work project for adults, right? Like keep, keep yourselves busy, make some money, <laughs> keep the economy going, <laughs> whatever. Uh, but after I saw this over and over again, I understood that there's an underlying pattern and that we treat information in a special way each time, and it really isn't. Um, I started to focus on information flow and saw that all we're doing is really accounting for information. Just like accountants, we should be working the same way, except instead of keeping track of money, we should be keeping track of information. Um, that little leap was quite good because there was a nice area where we could uh, collaborate and bridge a, a, a big gap that we saw. Um, so trying to push this really awesome way of working was very frustrating. I don't know if anyone's ever tried to move domain-driven design into their organization. Who's tried to implement some good practices into their organization? Did brown bag lunches? Show of hands. Who are the good people here that are trying to, about half. A few people don't want to admit. <laughs> Maybe they failed. But that's OK. I failed too. Um, there's a lot of money to be made in what someone already had successfully deployed the previous two years or whatever. So you're, you're not going to have an easy time bringing new practices in. And so this got to, you know, probably like most of you, I got pretty frustrated um, trying to do all the pulling and, you know, can lead a horse to water and all these kinds of analogies. And so in 2015, I said, well, if I can't make an organization do these things, I'll create an organization that only does these things. And it has absolutely no, uh, no compromise. There's no compromises. I'm not going to, just because this is hard to sell to some people, I'm not going to do it. I said, if they don't want it, then they won't use us. That's fine. Surprisingly, quite a lot of people wanted to work that way. So we've had no turnover at all in eight years. Uh, there's maybe two interviews that I've done the whole time. It's just crazy. When you create an environment like Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. If you create nerd nirvana, they will want to stay there. <laughs> so 
that's essentially what happened. But it was quite tricky what it took to do that. And some of the things that we had to throw away that we hung on to really, and myself also found really important in the previous years, that I had to totally think outside the box and throw these things away as absolute anti-patterns, where I was a huge proponent of them before. Now, that was tough for me to do, but it took many years, and the results spoke for themselves. So right now, since 2015, it's a multi-million dollar uh, corporation, valued well within eight figures, all without a single investment, all raised by profits from doing the work properly. So it does work. I'm here to tell you that all of these things, don't settle for less, do the right thing, even someone says that this is not possible or this is not what everyone does, stick with it. It's worth it. So what is this event modeling thing? I mean, kind of looked at it on the first slide, and I'm sure you've seen it before because I tweet about it a lot. Well, looking at information systems, we see very, two very important um, building blocks. No matter what your information system is automated with, whether it's CRUD applications, it's using DDD or hexagonal, it doesn't matter. There's events that happen over time. These are facts that the, that the system captures. If that fact is stored by some sort of ORM that distributes this over a bunch of insert statements to a bunch of tables, that doesn't matter. The concept in someone's mind is that this event happened and had this information that the system now stores. And state views. The fact that a whole bunch of stuff happened, we still got to make sense of it to, in order to do something, right? So the second core component of any system is some sort of projection of what some state is. For example, I want to know how many users I have. I want to know what's in my basket right now. I want to know X. I have to show something on the screen to someone. I have to show some sort of a buffer of items for a process to do. I use those words carefully for a reason. I don't want to use Sagas processors. I want, to, I want the to-do list, right? That's another part of these state views. It comes into automation. One of the things I realize is that just because we're automating a lot, it should be treated the way humans would do it on a screen and pressing a button. That demystifies quite a lot of things. So let's get through these building blocks and get into the meaty stuff, because I, if I spend too long on this introductory stuff, we won't have time for the advanced stuff near the end. So how do we get the events in? How do we get stuff in? We have to have some sort of intent. So that's a command. I command the system to register me as a user. I command the system to pay for my order. It's very imperative. It's empowering because you're empowering the user to change the state of the system. You empower a user by letting them take effect over the system, right? A, a, a shopping website is of, of no use if it just lists products, but it doesn't let you affect its state. Notice that I'm talking about this kind of like in systems thinking words, right? There's the outside and the inside, and you got to really pay attention to what happens at the borders. You'll notice that event modeling has this waterline, the timeline, where you actually see the dip into the system and the dip out. That's that systems thinking line that you can keep in mind the whole time and really understand what's going on. And screens and processors that I put in one, for, in one piece because it is the same thing. Uh, just because a computer does it doesn't make it much different than what a human would do. This is very important, because all we're doing is managing information, moving from left to right, transforming it bit by bit. Now, yeah, there are some domains that are research, and you're going to go and uh, find some uh, university that's doing the next uh, you know, uh, search algorithm, or you're going to have some crypto thing that does some hashing in a different way. That's not what 99% of the world is. 99% of the world is you being able to buy a cheeseburger. It's you being able to pay for your insurance on your car. It's you doing your everyday stuff. It's you flipping through stuff on Netflix on TV. That's not rocket science. Stop, treat stop treating systems like rocket science. We're not all rocket scientists here. Let's get real. We're just, we're just supposed to be responsible in how we treat information. So I had to get rid of this hubris, right? Oh, I'm so intelligent. I know all these awesome you know, enterprise integration patterns. Look how smart I am. What are you doing? You're just shoveling data from left to right. You're not so smart. You don't need all this hubris to surround yourself with. There's so much ego in all this, which is really damaging to us. So we have the arrangement, which is swim lanes down below. Where, how many different subsystems do we have in terms of storing information? Um, we have user swim lanes, so at the top we show what's happening, sort of like a, uh, a storyboard for a movie, or if you were to do a screencast of the application that already exists and just pause at each time that someone interacts or the state has changed. We capture that on, on this timeline. Um, 
And we do everything via slices. So there's a few people that, that already propo are proponents of slice based uh, work division, which means that you're going to be a full stack developer saying from all the way from UI all the way down to the database, you're going to be responsible for everything in between. You're not going to do this layered cake approach where, oh, we're going to have a database team and we're going to have a business logic team and we're going to have the UI people. Right? Those things always end in tears. You have different concerns. You don't know when to co coordinate with one another. We all kind of establish this end tier architecture stuff isn't that good for managing projects. Um, and then once we show this, what we would like to have from beginning to end, happy path, we also want to show some permutations of data, perhaps. So we have this method of showing as each event, as the state changes bit by bit, how does that view change? You can think of these green boxes, these state views, as kind of live reports. They kind of react right away to whatever events are getting stored if they care about those events. So. How do we get that going? Well, one of the best things about event modeling is that it's a collaborative process. So far, I haven't used any technical jargon to describe what is happening in the system. They are simply words like user registered, user added something to their shopping cart. That's key. That means people that are product owners, stakeholders, they all get to participate. They all understand what this is. I'm not hiding behind anything technical to kind of own something just for myself in my important silo. So it's about being very transparent. Collaboration forces you to be transparent and forces you to communicate in a way that doesn't alienate anyone. So there's a lot of doors that open with this methodology that you can start to say, well, let's invite a tester because they need to know if this, easy, if this, if this is easy to test or are we not thinking about their concerns from the previous iteration um, that maybe we should have their feedback as to how to make the system a little bit better for them. And same with development, same with architects. All these people have valid reasons why the system should be one way or another. And so you can get, not necessarily consensus, but if someone does make a decision, someone does have some power, at least it's done in the open with open feedback from everyone. So that if a compromise has to be made in your system, because the designers want it one way and the developers think that's stupid and you want to do it another way, a decision has to be made or we're at a stalemate, right? So this is a very fast way to do that. And someone can say, okay, we, we're not gonna solve this in this iteration, let's try it the way the designers are going, but at least we understand what that impact is. We can map that out. So I usually start these with, um, depending on the situation, I like to brainstorm all of the different events. So if I'm making a ride sharing app, I would think of all of the different things that people can do in a ride sharing app, such as uh, you know, calling for a destination uh, and then seeing who responds. Um, I can say uh, driver responded, uh, driver accepted, um, I paid for my trip, there's an updated location for the car that I'm tracking. You can think of all these events on a timeline, right? I first brainstorm them though and then put them on a timeline to see if I can make a story out of it. The reason behind that is stories are very important. Like a lot of this stuff is very similar to behavior-driven development and specification by example. Those practices are successful because they are part of the way that humans have communicated um, throughout all of history. It's the only way that as a species we're able to put for, to the next generation what we learned in this generation. It's, uh, it started with uh, drawings in the sand and cave paintings and then later stories around a fire and then later books, etc. But all of these things had a story if you look at a graph versus reading a story, you're going to remember the story. You're not going to remember what a graph looks like. It's very important. That's very human. That's why these things like BDD and TDD, sorry, BDD and uh, spec uh, uh, ex uh, specification by example, they're all highly successful because they're easy to remember. The fewer times you have to go back to reread something, the better a communication mechanism that is. So responsible architecture. So. I already talked about how automating a system is treating information the way accountants treat money. Like, don't throw away information. Understand how you got there. Have a breadcrumb trail. These event models provide you with that evidence of like, well, how could we get in this situation? I can see that this particular command on this screen is based on information that got gathered over these previous steps. So this is where we should look if there's a bug. At our company, we never have a bug that lasts for more than four hours from being identified, fixed, and deployed in eight years. Just doesn't happen. 
which is great. I don't want to, remember, I don't want to bring anything of the old ways that I was working. And one of those things was the whack-a-mole bugs or sifting through logs for five days. Never, ever again. Um, so immutability, guaranteeing expectations. You can see clearly what the intent is for one particular state change in the system understood by business. So business can understand such concepts as immutability, item potency. If you have uh, a concurrency issue and you're worried about making everything correct and having two-phase commit everywhere, what happens if you don't? That might be easier. What if last one always wins? You can show these, the repercussions of such decisions that if you cut out a month of development time, you're still okay. And you can do that in a clear way to both business and tech. Right? And then the slice approach. I singled this out um, on purpose because that's the way we track work. So we actually did move to fixed cost only and people get paid by the blue box and green box. And they have to guarantee that that work has no bugs. If there are bugs, they have to stop what they're doing and fix bugs. That's been the best carrots and sticks and people love that because it removes subjectivity. As long as everything works and scales, doesn't blow up the memory on the server, uh, you get paid. If you're junior, you might only get you know, one of these done in a couple of weeks. If you're senior, you'll get two or three in a week. It's actually shown just a huge discrepancy in the industry for what uh, we should be making. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, the difference between a level one and level two engineer, oh, this 10%, 15%, the variation's like in the double digits easily. You've had anywhere from $3,000 a month to $70,000 a month being earned. Um, between junior and senior. It's huge, and it's so subjective in terms of what you do that you cannot say this person has three years experience and this person has five, therefore this person's more productive. That's all garbage. There's, people are so different, and I'm so happy that I took the subjectivity out of what people get compensated for. So the other thing you'll notice is that everything has a UI component, even if you have like, uh, our company does everything back end. We have two screens and there's so much happening in the back end. Well, then why do you have 50 people working? They need to see something. The people that are administering the system behind the scenes, they are looking at dashboards, they're looking at logs, they're looking at other things. Um, for example, one of our clients was uh, Pay by Phone, uh, sorry, uh, Plenty of Fish. And uh, do you think in Plenty of Fish, this public dating site, that send message and receive message are very simple two screens that are two slices? No, of course not. There's a whole bunch of things such as uh, spam checking, uh, mapping dollars to uh, the letter S, uh, you know, all, and then translations for every language. Uh, you name it. It's, it was like 12, 15 steps. Um, but in the traditional way, it's kind of a messy thing to communicate. Oh, that's an extra large t-shirt size because it's this. Don't just say it's extra large t-shirt size. Show me why it's extra large and then move those things into separate pieces. So this by the slice and having this set of gears saying this is what the processor does. This is what a human being would do if we didn't have that capability to map the dollar to the uh, letter S, right? So we can all understand what's going on. We work on multiple models. This is very important because if we worked on fixed cost and the project got big, you know what happens to features, right? They're really easy to implement right at the beginning and then six months into the project, everyone wants to quit because each feature is like pulling teeth. Well, we'd be dead in the water if we did fixed cost and that happened to us. So by having multiple models, such as in a hotel system, room availability and cleaning schedule, instead of having that in a single table where you, where you have some columns for when the room was cleaned last and when you had, you know, the, whether the room is available, if you had it all in a single canonical model, those two pieces of the workflow, the cleaning people and the people that are trying to book the rooms, would have to share that. So if I'm working with you, and you're working on one screen, and I'm working on this one, I always have to coordinate with you. How are you doing with that table? Did you change the schema by any chance? I hope you didn't. Right? It's this kind of coupling that we really don't understand how the human coupling is affecting us. Because there's the technical coupling. Yes, we're sharing the table. But think about what that does to your workflow every day. Everyone at our company works on their own slice and they don't really care what the next person is. There's a very clear contract with what events happened before and what their shape is so they can get on with their work and they know that they can guarantee the state after for anyone else's work. 
these are the most powerful contracts ever because they have context of when things happen. Not just API signatures, but when things happened, what, the, what state of the system, uh, what's the, what was the state of the system at the time. That's very important that we usually don't have um, at our disposal. So we have two core patterns, as I, as I showed, uh, just command handlers and just event handlers. Uh, we do everything with event sourcing. There's not a single project in the eight years that we haven't. Hundreds of projects, millions of dollars, all done with event sourcing. So if someone says event sourcing is too hard, tell that to one of our guys because they will not work any other way. ORMs, CRUD, all these things hide so much complexity that keeps biting you. you just, you're not awake to it yet. And like I said, a lot of stuff that I believed true was totally false after many years. It took a long time to break my mind out of the old shell of where I used to be. So if you don't have a bunch of patterns, you just have these two, what's, replaceable? what's it replaced by? Templates. Templates are way more usable, so such as uh, like a login template. I can take from one project and just dump it into another one, copy, it, copy paste it in Miro to another one, adjust it a little bit. I have, oh, I have two more swim lanes in the system. Fine, add those. This goes here now, but you're starting already with the idea and the shape of what that is. So workflow templates have totally replaced what design patterns were for us, and it's incredibly fast, malleable, um, a lot of copy paste in what we do, which is in a responsible way. Uh, testing is very easy. Everything is, uh, uh, everything is set up with events. So we set up a situation. So who's familiar with uh, arranged act assert? Anyone know that? Or given when then, if you're a BDD person, given when then? Any designers here that know situation, motivation, value? No designers? Oh, good. Excellent. I, I'm liking this room. Everyone from every corner of the industry, that's great. So all of these have a very similar way of testing. You set up an environment and say, okay, if this is where we're at, if I do this, did it work, right? Very simple. So the same way we can do that with pulling the, the actual items off of the event model and start to talk to our testers and developers and say, you know what? That part of the workflow that we showed the happy path for, well, these are the ways that the login can fail. Here's your test cases. You can graphically show them and translate them almost immediately into test, into test code, acceptance code, whatever. Same thing with these state views, except they don't have that uh, when part because they're passive. Like, hey, if these events happened, what would the invoice look like right now? Right? I can start to say, okay, well, I'm gonna, in this case, I'm gonna apply a discount code and see what happens. In this case, I'm gonna have some other items that have different taxation rules. What's the invoice gonna look like? Those are awesome specs to hand off to development, right? You don't wanna leave things in this like hand wavy architecture thing. You wanna hand developers and testers something like this that they can say, yeah, I know exactly what is gonna make that work. I've given the opportunity for the stakeholders to actually have their word on how this is gonna work. So the hard part, what does it mean to become an expert in this? We did a lot of nasty things in the industry. We, um, no, we are not liked for calling out some of these things. Uh, we entirely dropped TDD. It doesn't exist for us, it's worthless. It's actually in the way. Um, because what is TDD? Um, is it just testing? Well, what's the difference between TDD and test first then? Start to ask yourself these questions. What is the scope of your refactoring when you're doing TDD? Did you get a scope? That's okay. TDD has always been used differently by different people. It's incredibly subjective. Like I can be a total astronaut and use my refactoring step to just maul over the entire solution and say, you know, we should be using this date class across the board because I'm refactoring and just stomp on everyone's work. Or I may be the dungeon master and I know that your effort doesn't matter and I can just revert all your changes and fix that bug and management's happy and to the hell with you and your technical debt goals, right? How many people have had that happen to them, right? I certainly had it happen to me. So yeah, there's a lot of things that we, uh, that we dropped. The ticketing systems and backlog, we simply identify areas on the, work, on the event model that, hey, next, the next thing I wanna release is all this. Cool, let's do that. Is it two weeks? I don't care. Um, it's the next measurable step. These artificial boundaries of sprints, et cetera, they're important when you're really suffering. Like Scrum and all these things, they give you structure when you absolutely don't know what you're doing. 
but it's not like once you have the cast on and your leg heals, you take the cast off, you throw away the crutches, right? So all of these things that we've done, scrum and agile practices, they're really crutches to get us to the next level. But for some reason, the industry is making so much money off of the crutches that they want us to stay in those crutches. So we've dropped them all. Um, we don't have code reviews. We don't have planning, poker or planning sessions. Uh, no retro, uh, re what's it called, retrospectives. I even, I'm forgetting some of them, it's great. Um, <laughs> but I mean, just to be fair, um, I was the Agile Vancouver committee. Like I ran these type of conferences in Vancouver for many, many years. And I taught test-driven development for 20 years or 15 or something like that. So I'm not talking about a butt here. This is like based on legit having taught this stuff, actual multi-year experience with it. So I'm not just uh, poo-pooing something I don't want to do or don't understand. Um, so the reason we <laughs> stopped caring about code quality, because the explosions are tiny. Like everyone's work, remember that autonomous slice thing? Like if someone really screws up, I can't just replace it. Like I don't care because their work doesn't affect the other person. All of a sudden, we decoupled individual efforts by using the multi-model uh, paradigm. I don't care if Joe is junior and is going to have a really hard time. His work is not going to throw a bomb into my work. It's, it's really key to have that. So it's also like throw out, throwing things out like uh, pizza-sized teams. Like We don't care if it's five people, 15 or 20. As long as everyone knows which part they're working on, this pizza-sized team is not, not important. Because that coupling, that human-to-human -human coupling, hey, I need to know what you're doing so you know, I don't step on your work. That disappears. All of a sudden, the pizza-sized team rule isn't that as important. Um, we dropped integration tests. We looked at what's the point of uh, automating the UI and all that. If we have such good care of state of the system, this thin layer of UI on top isn't that important. And so why not just have a green box that tracks what happened in each of these workflows together and make it count whatever you need to count for the integration test and treat it as a unit test. So, that's what we did. So all of our tests are unit tests. There's no integration tests in the traditional sense. So now all of our test suites run in seconds, less than a second in a lot of cases, because there's no mocks, there's nothing, there's no UI that spins up. Sure, there may be a few edge cases here where there's a tricky UI, and that's the value of the whole system, but those are outliers. I'm not counting that for your day-to-day. -day. Um, so that took away mocking frameworks. I showed you already this. Uh, given when then, we were just basically doing a uh, suite under test and firing a command at it or looking at a state view after forcing some events through it. It's, it's literally code with no dependencies. It's, uh, it's just uh, POCO if you're doing C Sharp, POJO if you're doing Java, whatever. Um, just plain classes that, that are easily translated to what a business person would see. Right? So we don't even worry about uh, DSLs and, uh, and all these BDD things because uh, the events actually state in business terms what's happening. So there's no translation between your requirements and what's on the event model, which is key. Uh, so no, no sagas, no middleware, no message buses. Um, maybe a few clients have them, but we certainly don't use them. We can put as many, like it's, it's a last ditch effort. If I really need to clean something up before putting it on the wire, sure, we'll have some sort of message bus. But boy, at the beginning in 2015, I thought this is something I was gonna do so much over and over again. I'm gonna do distributed computing and microservices all the time. It's like, pff, the times that we tried microservices just blew up in our face. It's like, oh wow, this means it's more, so much more expensive because we're translating these events, extra steps, extra steps, for what? Started to look at what the benefit was of this. And a lot of time, it was just so it looks good in front of architects. <laughs> There's no business value in it, it was horrible. So we'd basically not have none of these things most of the time. Um, in essence, what we've done is all of the things that domain-driven design wants you to end up with, an hexagonal architecture, clean architecture, you hear about this clean code, blah, 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 all this like fancy words, giant books that you'll never get through. We managed to reach that nirvana without it, just by throwing stuff away. Don't add stuff, throw stuff away. There's so much junk in your company that's just getting in the way, but it takes so much to get out of it. So um, one of the reasons I like what we do is that we show 
how much can be done with how little to give you hope. You're not going to do this tomorrow. You're not going to go into work tomorrow and say, hey, we're stopping Jira right now. Everyone, pff, it's deleted. Like, yeah, you'll probably be fired. Um, but <laughs> there are ways that you can always shoot for gold, right, and move towards those things. Just look at the examples of other companies that did that. If you wanted to have a company that was flat, didn't have uh, you know, a, a large management structure, you would look at GitHub or Valve. They had playbooks you know that it's possible. So you can start to emulate some of those things, start to investigate how that could work, what you can do in your own company to take some of those advantages. So same here. You know, just look at what we're doing with this simple thing and how much value we can bring by simplifying things. It's really hard to keep things simple. Like this industry is just full of distractions all along. Okay, so let's do some of these advanced things because I think I have 50, 20 minutes. Okay, and we, I want to leave some Q&A at the end, so maybe five minutes. I'm sure you guys are full of questions by now. Uh, so some of the technical things. This is a template, I think a Hugo template that I was automating. But you can use it for technical things. It's kind of like a visual way to show what happened in the debugger over time. Really, really useful. Sort of like a sequence diagram with a, with a core sort of view on top of like what the what things would look like along the way. Remember that visual part? You know, we have the visual people that want to see the screens. We have the analytical people that want to see the events and the data, whether it makes sense. We want to satisfy both sides. So this does the same thing for some technical stuff. Um, legacy code. I mean, yeah, this might be all good, Adam, but uh, it seems like it's all for brand new projects. Not at all. We've extended half of our clients or half of existing systems that we have to extend. So you probably read about uh, the strangler pattern or the bubble pattern from Eric Evans and all that. You can show that pattern very easily over workflows with this. You can see the, the screens um, that the old system has. In this case, it's a CRM. We represent events because that's what we think we're doing in that legacy system. Of course, it doesn't store those events, so I put a little brain picture there. That's kind of like what we're thinking. That's what's happening. But below, we show an insert statement into you know what what rows are being inserted and which columns are important at that point. And then we see a screen, and then we see what select statement is being run to populate that, uh, that screen. But then we use Nginx to say, this screen, this profile view, uh, that we're going to do on the side. That's our sidecar, that's our strangler, that's our bubble pattern. We're going to start to use this other system that we want to develop the way we like. And it's so buggy, we don't want to touch the old thing. We're going to fix bugs here, and we're also going to add features here, and we're not going to touch the old stuff. So you can see that it's event-driven. It has a, a fixing of a, I, I can't read it from here. Uh, I think it's fixing an, uh, an email and adding a profile picture capability, right? But then you have to write things back. So who's heard of a change data capture for event sourcing people? Yeah, a few people. So change data capture is kind of an important pattern in, in fixing legacy without swimming in the ugly code. Right? You kind of listen to what's going on in, in the database and uh, look for changes, translate those deltas into some sort of event that you can just publish from the old system and start to listen to it, and then build new capabilities based on those published pieces of information. Well, in the case of uh, fixing bugs, um, you're going to have to write back. So it's the opposite of CDC that's supported in this bubble pattern is that, you know what, that's fine. We have this brand new part of the system that takes care of profiles much better. It doesn't have the bug with the... Um, email, uh, it's got a nice profile pick capability that we added, but some of the stuff we need to write back as well because the rest of like the users and the profile information still has to be used in the old system. In this case, it's just brute force right to those tables. And I pray that you don't have triggers and sort of procedures doing magic, but you know, <laughs> take it one step at a time and start to unravel it from the state view. And uh, a lot of what I've done is based on Fred Brooks' initial um, findings you know, in the 60s where uh, he said, you know, you show me a, a flow chart or something, I'll continue to be confused. But if, I sh if you show me the tables in your system, I'll know exactly what it does. I just need to see the data and the tables. I'll know exactly everything I need to know about your system. Those are very fundamental words that were taught, you know, talked about 50 years ago plus, right? So it's still true today, except we have way more at our disposal, right? We can store these events. I have uh, a ton of space on my phone that could run an international insurance company from the 50s, no problem, right? <laughs> so we all have that storage. Um, this is not a lecture on, uh, on event sourcing, but it's you know, that mentality that we're in is sort of 
due to the fact that we couldn't do event sourcing uh, in the early days because storage was so expensive compared to computing. We never had the equivalent of the transistor revolution in storage. And so that's why we're here. Uh, we do polyglot development, so there's a bunch of solutions. Like we have one that does uh, .NET mixed with Node because the teams chose their solutions, but the underlying uh, piece there is the events are the same for both systems. So the integration of two separate technologies is great. And think about serverless. You can deploy whatever language each function you want in, and it'll still work. So think about doing serverless level type stuff on just regular infrastructure. So we've never said no to a specific technology because, well, if that person has that domain expertise, am I going to not hire them and just find someone that knows the same tech stack but is totally inept at doing insurance? No, that's a silly, silly compromise. Very bad for the business to not have someone that's a domain expert versus someone that just happens to know a syntax. Um, so cross entity, and this is a little bit expert. So if anyone is familiar with uh, domain driven design or event sourcing, this is for you. This is expert level. So um, in this case, I have a cashier's requirement that says uh, at any moment in time, I can't have more than $1,000 outstanding of produce on this giant supermarket. So it's something that's really hard to do in the given when then style for a single entity, unless you want a single entity for all cashier cash <laughs> registers, which is pretty silly, probably not, probably gonna have a separate order on each one. So how do you bring those in? Uh, you can simply bring in some of the information from a state view into the command to say, at this point, I know that the outstanding balance on all of them is this and therefore it can be used as part of the calculation as I'm calculating the state of that single till to make sure that the total isn't over 1,000. So a lot of the stuff that you see that, oh, you can't do this with event sourcing, oh, you can't do that, it's, of course you can. You just have to think a little bit differently in terms of what you were conditioned to uh, thinking before. So I just wanted to give that example as like an expert thing because expert things become quite easy with this. Um, Closing the books, a lot of things that uh, if people want to adopt event sourcing, they're like, oh, this is gonna be hard, it's gonna be impossible to do, we're gonna have a million events and it's gonna take forever to hydrate everything from them. Close the books. Your accountant doesn't go through 10 years of your taxes to do your current taxes, like they look at just the past year, maybe the previous year. Um, trading, day trading, they, they close the books at the end of every day, that's, the, that's it. Every, every entity's brand new the next day. Uh, your online bank probably has a rollover every month. That's what you would do on pen and paper. So do it in your real systems. We, we fail to do that. So closing the books is what you do to scale things. People archive, like if you want your old visa statement, you're going to go and um, pay $30 and they're gonna in five days give you a photocopy of stuff they pulled from storage, right? So think about things that way. And it'll make a very tiny, footprint for what you're doing currently. Gets a little bit trickier for complex state views, but you can explain the complexity and why it's gonna take you longer with event modeling. And now, of course, I had to change everything since last year because of this. <laughs> so a lot of the stuff I'm saying is, it, it's really stupid, simple little patterns. So what do we want computers to do? We want computers to do the stupid little things for us so we can concentrate on the important things. So we're not really afraid of AI anymore because we have a really good way of expressing things. However, there's an interesting thing with uh, AI. It's, it's been trained on a lot of things do, being done on CRUD and ORMs. So how are you gonna do something that's more intelligent with hexagonal or DDD or event sourcing using a large language model? You can't. And I tried, I mean, so many times I've had this thing tell me that uh, querying for current customers is a command. It's not, it's not changing the state of the system, it's not a command, and I keep giving it examples and still will ignore it over and over again because it's been so trained on what everything else does out there. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, so, yeah, training your own model is gonna be expensive, right? Um, so currently we're using AI on low level stuff, like I have this view, please make this nice, uh, you know, event handler or set of event handlers to make this table look nice for me. That works to that point. And, and then make this appear like this on a web page. That works fine too. But saying here's a, a few slices that I wanna do, giving the code for that, ah, it starts to fall apart. But we're getting there. 
Um, another good thing is to record your conversations about your product or your service. Feed that transcription into ChatGPT and say, give me the steps in an event model. And since because they moved the um, training data to 2022, it actually knows quite a lot about event modeling now. I can say, you are an event modeling expert, and you know about event sourcing. Give me the slices for an online shoe store. And it'll do it to a reasonable degree. You have to still prod it a bit, but for these reasons that I showed here. So let's take a look at what that could look like. So I said, you're an expert in event sourcing and event modeling as well. List the slices needed for a basic online store. So it starts to do horrible things. <laughs> Listing all events into one slice, uh, still doesn't know it. Okay, so give it a second go. Nope, it's still putting read models in slices that are supposed to change state. So no, that's not good. Give it some more. Okay, give it all this. <laughs> it's like, and also the seventh attempt, right? If you, <laughs> so, you really have to beat, beat this into its skull. But eventually it does recognize some things. It's finally started saying that, okay, there's user registration slice, which is a state change, and there's a state view slice, and it starts to understand that you show the UI first, you use examples, then you show the command, use examples for the data, and then you look at the event. Um, and for the state view, um, you're going to look at exactly what the state view has, your model, that, and then the UI that's gonna get populated from that. So it starts to actually look pretty good. And I'm quite confident that in you know, uh, 12 months time, we're gonna go pretty fast with this stuff. It's gonna be pretty good. So yeah, what to do after this? You can start to force it to make references so you get data integrity. One of the strongest points about event modeling is that you can audit it. I had one of the largest uh, problematic uh, rescue projects ever. Have event modeling solve the problem of finding that one green box that was causing the issues. It was a really, really large trading platform that did like 5% or 10% of the world's trading traffic for, for the Fortune 50. So no pressure, Adam, solve this one. <laughs> but it, it took to the point where we had an event modeling session and one of the BAs, a very smart Harvard educated guy, said this is why your sticky notes won't work, Adam. I was like, okay, well, take me through it. And in 45 minutes, because it was in front of everyone, he didn't corner me in the room and started yelling at me, we were able to untangle that hardest piece. And after two unsuccessful rewrites, they rescued the project and it got deployed successfully. So this stuff's yeah, quite, quite good. Um, so yeah, creating custom GP, I, I can, this is, this is gonna change in like a month. So don't worry about this. <laughs> it's changing so fast right now. Uh, hackathons are amazing with this. Uh, I remember one of the first times we entered a hackathon, we went and uh, just destroyed the competition because we took the first half hour to make an event model. And then everyone knew what they were doing. They picked the slices they wanted to work on. They had a really good idea about the rough kind of uh, contracts that they're gonna have, not just in terms of APIs, but also like when they were gonna get called, they could coordinate with that person. Yeah, we got like twice, three times the work done than any other team. So definitely this kind of thing helps and if you're doing it in your company, great way to experiment with this. Have some teams that want to do it, have some teams that don't, see it for yourself. What are people saying? In Australia, in Melbourne, they say this. I'm not sure if it's a tool of a reference, but it just popped up on Netflix in Canada. So I was quite enjoying it. <laughs> so um, anyone, anyone can do the accent or how they say it? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, joking aside, um, it's, been, um, it's been awesome. In 2018, this was basically top story on Hacker News. It just really exploded back then. Not sure why, was it 2019? I forget, one of those years. But that's when it really started. I wrote the initial um, article on it and it, it really started to take off. I didn't know why my email was going off and my alerts were going off, but all of a sudden people really liked it. Um, I got to talk briefly online in, the, in emails with Fred Brooks before he passed away, which is like one of the best things ever to happen in my career because he's the reason that I did a lot of this. And so um, he did uh, get a chance to look over it, but he wanted to study it. And unfortunately, shortly after this, he passed away, but it was really nice to connect with him. He's the author of The Mythical Man Month along with Mel Conway. Uh, so it was really cool to have that. Um, so yeah, people that are running these, they have, they just keep writing these messages to me, right? 
Um, everyone was blown away, like in this one. It's, it's great. And, and Vaughn Vernon himself writing, right? That's, it's powerful and simple. It's, it's also backwards. It's, it's powerful because it's simple. <laughs> That's one of the things, right? Um, so you can teach you know, these hard concepts. Like you're, I want people to do you know, clean architecture. I want people to do um, hexagonal architecture. I want them to embrace DDD and ubiquitous language. Well, here's a platform that makes it easy to do that. You can put those concepts into a format that's easy to communicate with and, and actually has grounding and actual information flowing through the system. Right? So um, yeah, I think I want to be done to have some time for questions and answers. I think we have five minutes left. So um, thank you so much for listening to me. I'm ready for your questions. Noise. <laughs>